We are very honored and very proud to have the inventor of C++, Bjarne Strauss, Strauss to give our give keynote. Our keynote. And he was supposed to be here in person last year. Um, COVID kind of changed our plans and everyone else's. So he agreed to join us this afternoon. And hopefully next year, uh, he'll come and visit Israel. So Bjarne, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I would of course, um, very much have liked to be with you instead of going through all this electronic stuff. But uh, well, it's a difficult year and uh, maybe next year, as you said. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about C++, specifically uh, about C++ over the last 15 years. Um, this is based on a paper I was asked to write for the History of Programming Languages conference. And um, this is the fourth uh, conference on the history of programming languages. And I gave a massive uh, paper for that one. That was electronic too. Uh, basically, this is the same talk, except this one is going to be better because you gave me some more time. And I'm talking to, to you when I can see you rather than to talk to a blank wall, which I absolutely hate. Anyway, um, so this conference has gone on four times. This is my third presentation of C++, which is a record both for a language and a person. So um, hopefully this is good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what C++ is and is supposed to be. Then I'm going to focus on the last 15 years because, well, there's two more papers that you can read about the previous uh, 30 years and uh, then say a little bit about the future because you can never get away from uh, doing that. Um, I have a bunch of uh, pictures, photographs that has something to do with, with C++, uh, mostly over the last um, uh, 15 years. Uh, so here's a little Mars copter that was uh, flying around at the time where I uh, made up these slides. And since it's flight control software C++, I thought it was appropriate. If there's nothing else you can do while I'm talking, you can always guess what the pictures are about. Um, first, I have to remember to, to thank the lots of people who has helped uh, build C++ over the years, because you just don't get something at this scale uh, as the work of a single person in a, in a single event. And so there's the reviewers of the paper, uh, informal and formal, mostly the informal ones, and a lot of C++ software exports, uh, experts that I've been talking to uh, over the years, and users I've been talking to over the years. I'm going to em emphasize feedback. A lot of C++ is there because I've talked to people, I've heard problems, I've suggested solutions, people have told me why the solutions didn't work and I fixed them, and so feedback is essential. And um, C++ uh, was born at uh, Bell Labs in Murray Hill in New Jersey. Um, that's uh, about 30 miles that way. And um, this is a great place. Um, it was the best place for applied science and engineering uh, at the time. Uh, in my opinion, there's nowhere like it in the world today. But basically, there was a very rich technical culture. There was brilliant people in a huge variety of fields attacking a huge variety of problems. And uh, some of these people were really great. And so you can see here, there's the building. It's not pretty, but well, it's there. And uh, lots of hardware stuff um, was invented there, including stuff we are using for this communication, right? Um, computers, uh, cameras, uh, fiber transmission, and a lot of the software we're using, C, C++, or Unix, S, uh, I forgot to add S because R is now important. And so the idea is that you get innovation, you get progress uh, by having invention plus development. Uh, you don't just write a paper about it, you build it so that people can use it and you rely on feedback. Um, I mentioned 
this mostly for the academic conference. Academia and education people and industry tend to look at programming languages in different ways. Uh, so to caricature or oversimplify, academia really insists on cleverness, novelty, and uh, papers. Uh, education wants simplicity, things that are easy to teach, whereas industry is a bit more complicated. They want familiarity of the solution to things they already understand. They want performance. They want completeness. You have to solve the whole problem. They want stability because, well, software lives for a very long time. They need a tool infrastructure. They need complete systems. They need support for both the software and the teaching and uh, training. They want interoperability with systems you've never heard of. Uh, they want conformance to industry standards, however weird or uh, unknown. All of this stuff is necessary to succeed at scale. And um, C++ was designed for industry. That shows it doesn't have the latest novelty always. It doesn't have the simplicity that the educators want, but it has steadily um, increased its utility. And it is widely used in academia and education. I would like to see more use, of course, but then I would. Um, so the, the way I evaluate a programming language is the quality of its applications. If you do something good with a language, the language must be good. And so um, here's a, sort of a, a view of uh, what, what C++ is, is being used for. And uh, yeah, um, it's, it's all over the place. And um, C++ was, uh, had, had a design strategy from, from rather early on. Uh, I wanted to solve a particular problem, but basically once I was thinking about a language, I wanted to improve the state of real world software. That is the kind of software I depend on, my friends depend on, you depend on. And the key there is the direct expression of ideas in code. If I can write it cleanly, if, I, if the, uh, the compiler can understand it, you can generate good stuff, you can uh, maintain the code, etc. From direct expression of ideas and code, we get reliability, performance, maintainability, and improved uh, development time. This is this is great. This is what we want. And you have to start small and grow. I mean, in the beginning, it was just me and then a couple of friends, and then it grew. But still, C++ has not never had a, a large, dedicated design and implementation team. Uh, so you have to start small and grow. Also, that is the only way of getting the feedback. How do you know that you are solving the right problem? Uh, that is my constant problem. I hated not being able to travel last year because I can't talk to users. I can't get the feedback. If you've got an agenda, people speak to the agenda. They don't give you the real problems. And so uh, I need to talk to people. So we have to rely on feedback. That's good engineering. And we can't grow faster than we can get genuine uh, feedback. Uh, on the other hand, you can't incre incrementally grow unless you have a fairly good idea where you want to go in general. And so uh, you try and articulate uh, ideas for where you want to go, how you want to go there and such. Um, so here's uh, some design rules from the C++ uh, design and evolution of C++ that I wrote uh, in uh, 1994 as a response to the first uh, History of Programming Languages conference. And a lot of these things are uh, still relevant today. I'm emphasizing abstraction mechanisms so that you solve problems in general rather than embedding particular solutions in the language. I'm very keen on static type safety uh, and an expressive type system. And really, really, we need to use hardware well because despite what people claim performance, efficiency is important. The only thing that grows faster than uh, hardware performance uh, seems to be human expectation. Whenever we get a faster computer, somebody wants to do even more with it. Uh, and so we started out early. And one of the things that happened right in the first week was the idea that resources had to be managed. I came out of machine architectures and operating systems, so that seems obvious. And so here is the uh, archetypal C++ program. It defines a new type. 
so that we can control what uh, we're talking about, so that we can put the abstraction straight into the code. And um, there's a vector, you have to, con you can construct it with n elements and you can clean it up, you can destroy it. And uh, it's an abstraction and since there's an interface here that is clean, gives the facilities we want. And there's an implementation there, which is the next level down in the um, abstraction hierarchy. In this particular case, we're starting out for the ground. Uh, pointers and integers is what you find in the hardware. And given that, <coughs> we can then do a vector of doubles. I have parameterized the um, abstraction with a type. Uh, this we couldn't do till a few years later, but anyway, a vector of double, and we can assign double to it. We can subscript it. Um, that's the operations are in the dot, dot, dot there. Vector of strings, vector of file handles, and at the bottom here, everything's cleaned up. The memory is released, the strings are cleaned up, but the file handles, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the basic idea. You construct objects, you control what happens to them during their lifetime, and then you clean up your mess before it gets um, painful. And uh, <coughs> this, this is the resource uh, management model. All of the uh, standard library containers follow this. Vectors, lists, single link lists, maps, etc., hash tables, but also things that are not just memory. There's the smart pointers, there's threads, locks, uh, input file streams and such. And so this model is not just memory management, it's resource management. Uh, when you get out of a file stream, you have to close the file. You can't just throw away the memory. So that's that's the model. And uh, all of this works uh, recursively. So I can have a vector of lists of uh, shared pointers and things like that. Okay, so now we move forward to uh, the, the real topic of this talk. This is the blue thing up here. Uh, C++ started back in uh, 79 under the name uh, C with classes and it grew gradually as expected. And the number of users grew um, quite surprisingly so. And uh, then something uh, not so nice happened. The user population in, uh, started to decline and I'll explain why. And then we started going up again in uh, after 2006 where we started. If you read the paper, you'll see I claim that those uh, four and a half million users, I um, got some feedback on that and it was basically, you are wrong. There is more than five million users today and uh, you better fix it, so I, I did. Uh, so in 2006, uh, C++ was no longer new and exciting. It was 25 years old. There was not all that um, uh, novelty to go with it. There was about 3 million users, but it was declining. And it's never nice to have a declining user um, population. There must be something wrong. And there was no major commercial backers. A lot of the people who have been uh, very interested in C++ have built their own uh, languages uh, like Java and C Sharp. And um, there was a big uh, standards committee, which is good, of course, but also means that uh, it slows down progress. It's hard to get lots of people to agree on anything. And um, people marketed proprietary languages with massive ecosystems. Um, there, there was more use, there was more money spent on the marketing of these languages than there was uh, spent on the development of uh, C++. And uh, <coughs> academia was pushing for alternatives. They were very keen on simplicity. Uh, Java was advertised, for instance, as being significantly simpler than C++. Uh, people were waving C++ books in the air with um, pages written out and saying, all of this you don't need to know. Um, of course, Java uh, tripled in size and is now about the size of C++, but uh, that was not seen at the time. And um, there, there was things, however, that was in C++'s favor. Single thread performance stalled in about 2005. Uh, basically, you could fry an egg on a, uh, on a processor and that was not viable. You had to do other things. 
so that it now became valuable to write efficient code instead of just waiting for the hardware to get faster. And um, people started to notice that it was really expensive to run all of those computers because they used too much energy. And so people switched from sheer performance to performance per watt. Um, and uh, that again emphasized the quality of programmers who could write good code and languages that supported such uh, people. And um, the thing that, that really helped C++ in that world was that everybody seemed to want to control the whole world. So there was a fight for platform dominance, uh, Java versus Microsoft versus Apple uh, and similar things on, other, uh, on, on, on embedded platforms. And in the end, a lot of um, people who were actually selling systems but building systems for others decided that if they want to work on all the platforms, they'd better use C++. And so we went, um, we, we went back to the growth pattern. And since then, uh, C++ use have almost doubled, which is not bad for a language that every week is proclaimed to be dead. Um, that has happened since, well, before, you, before you, uh, a lot of you were born. Okay, so uh, C++ is controlled by a standards committee. There's a standards process uh, under ISO. It was started in 89. That is people, representatives from HP, IBM and Sun turned up in my office and uh, twisted my arm um, vigorously saying that I really, really wanted to standardize C++ under ISO rules and after twisting my arm for an hour and telling me what would happen if I didn't, uh, I agreed. So that's what we did. We got a first standard in uh, 98 and then we got a whole bunch of standards after that. And uh, all of them were unanimously approved after a year of work. The point is we keep working till people agree. Uh, we don't ship things that uh, are considered very controversial because that will create dialects. And uh, so there's the ISO and there's the national standards body. Um, I don't think I have Israel's logo here. Maybe you don't have a nice logo, but I didn't find it. Uh, but the aims of this, of standardization is actually to increase uh, commerce, but basically stability support for a wide range of users and I am keen on defending against when vendor logins. The vendors always want to um, make sure that their users don't go to other vendors uh, while getting other vendor, vendors' um, uh, users. Uh, we need to have a standard to make sure that things can be exchanged among the implementations. And I don't like dialects because the larger a community is, the, the more they can share, the, the better things are. And we want to improve the language and the standard library, of course. But notice that was the bottom of my list. Uh, the language is a tool, um, the aims are something else. So here's the committee. We started uh, small uh, back in the days where the world was uh, black and white. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And last year, uh, just before uh, the virus hit uh, at scale, we met in Prague in the Czech Republic and uh, approved C20. And you can see um, a huge number of people there. I think the number is 260. You have to get 260 people to agree on something and they have a strong opinions and you have them, we got them to agree and to vote unanimously in favor. This is, this is good, but it's also a problem because it shows how much agreement you have to create, how much negotiation, how much talking, how much persuasion you have to do. It's not easy. So we started with about 40 members and uh, we had uh, 350 members uh, last year. We probably got more today. Um, this means that the C++ Standards Committee is significantly larger than all the other language committees put together. And lots of uh, nations, and uh, it's mostly industry still. C++ is, grew out of industry for industry needs, and that shows. But there's a few universities, lots of small terms, and a lot of 
uh, individuals, many who turns up proudly declaring that they represent self. Uh, so you may have noticed that uh, there was a, a rather large gap between the 98 standard and the next one in 11. This was partly that we couldn't, we, we, we thought we had to have a delay, we were wrong, and partly because once we got near to voting, people decided that something was really important to get in and we postponed. And some of us, notably Herb Sada uh, and me secondarily, decided that this could not last. 13-year uh, delays are not good in the modern days, so we decided on a train model. Uh, the, the standard ships when the standard is supposed to ship, and if your proposal doesn't meet it, it has to wait to the next one. And since the next one goes in, in years, you know when that is. And so we, we st started the train model, I argued for a short period, and three years is what we've got. People told us we were crazy. You couldn't deliver a standard in another three years. We did in 14, we did in 17, we did in 20, and we will deliver one in uh, 23 uh, to maintain the momentum, to maintain the, the cadence of delivery. And if your feature doesn't meet it, try for the next one. Um, there's a standards process. It's a committee process and there's a huge danger in lack of direction and uh, designed by committee, because really it's not even stand, uh, designed by committee, it's designed by a federation of committees. So a subcommittee on something like numeric or embedded systems or new language features can even have, can easily have a couple of dozen people in it. So this is interesting. Now, we could of course freeze, that is they could agree on nothing and then we would get fossilization, there would be nothing that happens, or we could get delays, or people could get overexcited by uh, untried ideas, a large group of people can get very excited. So these are the dangers, we're trying to deal with them. Okay, direction is uh, essential. Um, Every time I talk to somebody, I get the, this request. You really, really must simplify C++. It's too complex. And by the way, while you're at it, please add these two features. They are very essential. We must have them. And whatever you do, don't break my code. Uh, this is, of course, impossible. Uh, you can't do all three, uh, but you have to make progress in all three. And I'm going to talk about that. But basically, um, we need to set direction. There's even a direction group in the standards committee now uh, by very experienced people who is trying to make sure that things go in, in some definite direction. It is not enough just to add features and you'll get sort of <coughs> this view of the world, the Swiss army knife with all uh, blades out at the same time. This is not the aim. The aim is a web of interrelated, mutually supported features so that you can build um, very interesting things out of, of, of it. Um, so the, the, the ideal is not the Swiss army knife. It's more like Lego blocks. You, you build things out of it. And this is hard. So why uh, change at all? Why don't we just freeze it, um, wait for somebody to come up with something really much better? Um, well, we have to do something because the world change uh, and, and we change. Um, if, if we don't evolve, we really have to stop and hope for somebody else to rescue us. Um, and um, well, then it comes down to the fact that no language is perfect and for everybody and everything. So you have to accept prom compromises. Even if something new and better uh, came up, it would get this problem as soon as it got widespread. That is um, the need for evolution, the need for discussing uh, uh, stability versus evolution will come from any successful language. And so I aim for major changes. By major, I mean change the way we think and um, minimize minor changes because that's just seen as uh, noise as distraction. It doesn't make a significant difference, but it's something you have to ad adapt to that, that you try to, to minimize. So uh, we need to get both stability and evolution. And we can't simplify the language because that breaks your code. 
but we can simplify the use of the language. We can diagnose things that are too hard to do, too error prone, too slow um, in performance or, or development, and then provide alternatives. And then we can try and get people to move from the old way of doing it, things to the new way. And it's not enough to demonstrate that the new way is better because people don't like to change their code. They may have a million lines of it, it's not easy. And so we need to uh, support this change with tools that allows people to uh, move forward. Uh, that's basically a static analysis, the way I, I see things. But basically we have a project that's been going on for five years now called the C++ Core Guidelines. It's, uh, it's an open source project with a lot of contributors. And basically the fundamental aims that we can actually deliver now is no resource leaks, no memory corruption, without a garbage collector, uh, no, without limiting expressiveness and without damaging performance. Uh, this is pretty good. Uh, we need better support uh, in the static analysis to, to really get there, but we are getting there. A lot of this can be delivered at scale. I'm not interested in a system that will allow you to improve a page full of code for an academic conference. I really want those million line systems to get uh, improved. So um, in C++ 11, uh, which uh, came just uh, at, at the beginning of this uh, period, um, I, I, I claimed that it felt like a new language. It, it, I just, my way of writing code changed for the better. And that was to my mind, the uh, proof that this was, this was good, that we had done a good job. And so it, it improved the language in a variety of ways, concurrency support, of course, because concurrency was getting much more important now that single thread performance weren't improving. So we finally had formal support for concurrency. Of course, C++ always been used for concurrency. The very first library that was written by me uh, for single classes, C++ Ancestor, was a cold chain library that, that allowed me to write multi uh, threads of control simulations. We needed to simplify the use because we observed that people were writing bad code where they didn't need to, but they wrote bad code because they had to write too much code. Improved support for generic programming. Generic programming had increased in importance. We wanted to improve type safety and did. Improved support for library building. Just about anything you do to a language uh, can, can be used there. And uh, add some library, uh, standard library components. C++ cannot compete with the huge commercial libraries that are people spending dozens of millions of dollars on building, but we can support components that everybody can use in the standard library. Um, <coughs> so um, over this period, we then went uh, from C++ 11 to 14 to 17, which was sort of these two were not, not massive improvements, but definite improvements, gradual improvement. And we got to C++ 20, uh, which uh, we got uh, voted in last February. It became official in December and the implementations are shipping now with most or all of the features. And uh, the major uh, facilities that we are offering now is modules, concepts, coroutines, and much better uh, compile time support and there's some new uh, standard library components, ranges, dates, formatting, parallel algorithms, and span. And I'll talk a little bit about this. The important thing is that this stuff is shipping. I, this is not science fiction. I, I love science fiction, but this is a technical talk. <coughs> so um, I'm going to show you some language features from uh, this sequence of releases of the standard. And I'm going to focus on, on these issues. I would love to talk about concurrency and parallelism, but that really deserves its own talk. I tried to get people to write a second C++ paper for the History of Languages conference, but they, uh, they, they, they didn't have the time to do that. They were too busy writing code, I suspect. 
uh, but that really is a topic of its own. And so is libraries. Sorry about that. Um, I, I just can't uh, do it. I used 168 pages on the language and the basic library stuff. I have just over an hour to give the talk. I can't go there now. So let's look at little things. We, I, I say we want to do big things, but one of the things that matter is to fix little warts, little annoyances. So I'll start with that. Um, here I'm saying auto X uh, 10. This is uh, simply deduce the type from the initializer so that I don't have to write the type again. This becomes uh, particularly important when the, uh, the type of the initializer is a bit hard to write, like the um, iterator that is an iterator for the container V, uh, for the element type of the container V and all of that. So it gets simpler. Um, this actually was the first uh, feature um, uh, the oldest feature on C++11, because I designed and implemented it in uh, 83, 84, but was forced to take it out again because nobody believed it was useful and because uh, it was an incompatibility with C. Um, we got the range for because the writing the C style loop with initializer, condition, and um, it uh, an increment is, is just too long-winded when you just want to do everything, uh, to do something to every element in a, um, in a container that's useful. And you can actually deduce the, uh, the um, element type from the element type of the container. So that simplifies things. And this sort of starts out the, the way of doing type deduction a lot. You can design a vector. It deduces the element type to be integer. I can uh, initialize a lock without saying what is the mutex because the compiler already knows what the mutex is, so we deduce it. Um, there's a lot of type deduction coming mostly in 17 and 20. Um, it cleans up the code no end. Um, the other thing that simplifies things immensely is the move uh, semantics. We'd been doing tricks for uh, many, many years, but Howard Hinnant uh, promoted a uh, formalization of the notion of move semantics. Um, this is a history talk, so I put pictures of people who did things in it. Um, I would have liked to put even more pictures in it, but there's a few uh, here. So basically, we used to write code like this. Uh, if you need a lot of data coming out of a function, you put it over on the free store and you return a pointer to it. And now out from this computation comes a pointer. We have to need, use it as a pointer and we have to remember to delete it or remember not to delete it if the ownership is elsewhere. Uh, this is a huge burden on people. They have to think about uh, manually man managing resources, which, which is uh, not good. We are, not, we are good at uh, acquiring things like from a library and we're not so good at remembering to put the books back in the library. Uh, we, we have to make this implicit and this becomes implicit here. I am computing a lot of data and I'm assigning it straight to a variable of the type, which happens to be a container. And the way that's fundamentally done is that inside the function that compute things like compute, we have a handle to the container. Here's a vector. There's a lot of elements there. There could be a million or a billion of them, but the handle is, well, two or three words. And so all we need to do is to take the information from the handle, put it into a handle in the outer scope, and then um, remove the local reference so that it does, things doesn't get destroyed on exit. And that's basically now we can move objects rather than copying them. Um, copying is, is, is maybe what you do at the low level of the computer. I mean, you can't move an integer, you have to copy it. But for higher level abstractions, movement and copying are different and movement is usually very much cheaper. And uh, so that's what, what, what we did. And now I can write a C++ example to, to, to show the difference between the older 
um, pre C++ 11 and more modern style of uh, C++, which uh, unfortunately not everybody has caught up with, but uh, we'll see. So here I want to find uh, all elements in C that has the value V. And this is parameterized on, on anything that you can look into and anything you can look for. And I return a vector of pointers to the elements in the container. Uh, that's what I want to find. So I start out with an empty uh, container of pointers to elements. And then I go through all the elements and ask, does that uh, element have the value V? And if it is, I push its pointer at the end of the vector. So I grow the vector as much as needed. And then I return uh, the result, which is I return this vector. Uh, note that this vector uh, might actually be rather large. If I had fed it a container with a billion elements and gotten a, a thousand pointers back, this is a non-trivial amount of memory. But we have move semantics, so it doesn't cost anything. Copying a vector um, representation, uh, not the elements, but the, the handle is dirt cheap. So let's test it. Here's a string. A string is a container of characters. Mary had a little lamb. And so for all P, for all pointers that I get out of find or for Mary had a little lamb, looking for the A's, um, I get them all and I test whether there's a bug. They better point to A's or something is very wrong somewhere. So this is a simple test program. And the importance of this library is listed here. It is basically what's not on the slide, what I'm not doing. There's no explicit allocation. There's no deallocation. I don't manipulate pointers. I don't uh, copy things. Uh, there's no opportunities for overflow unless you run out of main memory on your computer, in which case the, um, the, the program stops. Um, there's no overflow. It's basically a third of the size of the C++ 98 program that had to take care of all of these things. And if it didn't take care of these things, bad things would happen in real world code. So we're going to talk about uh, generic programming. Um, this is uh, something that um, I worked with in the early days, but Alex Stefanov made the uh, version that uh, is in C++ today. Um, in the standard library, just about everything is parameterized with types and a few things with, with values, but basically you start out with containers, of course, they're parameterized with a container type. Uh, the concurrency is, is, uh, is, is based on generic programming time, everything basically. And um, I started out, I, I wrote something in 80, um, which says we need this kind of parameterization. And I conjectured that macros were good for that. I was very wrong about the solution, but I was right about the problem. And so I returned to the uh, problem a few years later and designed uh, the initial templates. Um, they had to be extremely general and flexible. I didn't want to do something, uh, design something, could only do what I could imagine. Um, I wanted the overhead to be zero. Uh, <coughs> I wanted to be able to use a vector or matrix where a C array was uh, used at the time. And of course, I wanted uh, well-specified interfaces. I was the one that designed the uh, function uh, argument checking and declaration that's now in both C and C++. Um, so I, I knew about that, but I couldn't do all three. I didn't know how to do it. I asked around. Nobody seemed to know how to get all three. You can get either of those three, uh, two of those three, that's easy, but getting all three is hard. And so I have thought for C++, I have to go for flexibility and zero overhead. And then I kept working for um, another 20 some years uh, trying to solve the last problem. In um, the period from 2004 to 2009, we worked on a thing that was modeled about classes, a bit like uh, what you get in Haskell. And this uh, grew amazingly complex and costly and in incomplete and, and very hard to use. So we had to give up on that, back it off. It was supposed to be the 
uh, main feature of C++11. We got nothing because we couldn't do it right. We came back with another approach, um, which has been working, we've been working on since 2003 until now, which is basically compile time predicates. Uh, first order predicate logic can do all kinds of good things and it can in particular help us uh, do generic programming. So we can now do a precise specification of a template's uh, requirements of its arguments. So basically, um, we started out uh, with templates <coughs> in 88 and came in the standard in 98 by saying, well, we'll take any type. And uh, then we wrote our code based on any type and we saw how it used it. And if the arguments we gave to the template was of the right type, <coughs> that is something we had anticipated, <coughs> then um, everything was fine. We got something that could do anything we had wanted and could work really fast and things were happy. <coughs> However, we gave an argument type that was unexpected, didn't meet the requirements that was implicit in the implementation, we got truly horrible error messages. You must have seen them, many of you have. Um, I, I have had error messages from five line programs that uh, took thousands of lines to write. Truly horrid. Uh, I, I knew that um, more or less when I designed classes, but I didn't think I had any choice. In um, C++20, we can do better. I can say the iterator has to be sortable. Sortable is a predicate, a compile time evaluated predicate. It's defined in the standards. So I can say I want a sortable iterator. It says it has to have the properties of random access and being able to compare elements and all of that kind of good stuff. And the code looks just like it always did. Um, if everything uh, is fine, it's fine. And it runs at the same, exactly the same speed as the old stuff. There's no runtime overhead. The difference is that if I want to sort something that doesn't make sense to sort, you get a decent error message pointing at exactly this line. Um, basically, you can define concepts as use patterns. Concept is a compile time predicate. It just runs at compile time, yields a Boolean. And it takes either types or values or combination of the both, that's good. And you can build them from fundamental language uh, properties. So I can say that two types, T and U, are equality comparable. If, if you take a T and you take a U, you can compare them with the operators and get a Boolean out of them. Um, that, that's about all. And uh, you don't have to define equality comparable because it's already in a library. It's always hardest to do the most fundamental functions. That's true in uh, mathematics, and uh, it's true in, uh, in, in, in sort of computer science al algorithms, and it's true for concepts. Uh, most of the work for doing this kind of thing was done by Gabby Desrays and me, and there's a paper about it in Pobble 06. This is the only Pobble paper I've ever written because usually I'm more to the engineering side of things, but I actually do have a problem paper. Um, on the other hand, just like with ordinary functions, you usually work at the higher level, a little bit away from the raw language, and you can compose uh, concepts out of other concepts. So an R is a sort of a range if it is a random access range, and if its iterator is uh, sortable. This is not rocket science. And again, you don't actually have to invent these. They're, they're in the standard library, so, so you can use it. Uh, a lot of this done was done with, together with Gabby and me and Andrew. We were together working at Texas, in Texas A&M at the time. And Andrew did the first implementation of this in uh, GCC. And uh, <coughs> once you've got your interfaces specified, you can start using that information in the compiler. So for instance, um, in, uh, I, I would, well, this is semi-theoretical. I would like to sort a list. 
In the standard, it says that you can sort things that have random access and, and lists most certainly don't have random access at any reasonable efficiency. So I would like to overload it. I want to provide a forward sortable, uh, so to be able to uh, sort a list. There's a good algorithm for it. Uh, Alex Stefanov has presented it. If not, uh, you could use my usual dirty trick, which is to copy the list into a vector, sort the vector and copy elements back again. Uh, this is again, not very um, uh, advanced, but basically we have the old uh, code here. It, it's there, that's fine. That uh, for, for any old type we can use, uh, uh, we, make it, we just require it to be sortable. And then we can do a sortable range of sort. Uh, which uh, is, is for range checking and a forward sortable range for uh, range checking of list. So we can start using these. The three things are distinguishable from the type system. So when we call something, we can see what works. Um, sorting a couple of iterators to a vector works. It's uh, work with the old one. You can try and do it. We'll get an error as always because that's a list and uh, we pick uh, this two, uh, two argument version and it will not work. It'll give me a compile time error. The uh, error message will uh, be much better. And then I have uh, finally gotten rid of all of this begin end stuff, which is necessary for generality, but is not in my code. The uh, 95% uh, of the uses are whole container. So sort the list, it will pick the forward sortable range. A list has forward transversal, so that's why it's called forward sortable range. And the vector will pick the sortable range. Uh, why doesn't it, why does it pick the, the vector and the list in the right that way? Basically because the predicates are compared by the compiler, and it notices that a forward sortable range is a subset of the uh, sortable range. And therefore, if you meet all the criteria of a sortable range, you pick it. If you meet only the requirements for the forward sortable range, uh, you pick that one. And if these two uh, sets of predicates are not sub, uh, subset of each other, you get an ambiguity and uh, the compiler stops you. Um, basically, um, concepts represent, uh, can represent um, relationships. It, it's not just a type of type. It is a predicate over a number of, um, of types and uh, values. And um, I find that in real code, most functions take more than one argument. So here we have a sort where I have given it as a predicate, the, um, the, the, the comparison operator, which is the more general for our kind of sort. It, it's defaulted to less, but uh, you can provide your own. And that means we have to state that the predicate is a predicate over the element of the range type. And so we have two, um, two, two, two elements here. It's parameterized by two types and uh, they have to match. So you have to have a relationship, not just type of types. And um, actually, if you are just a type of type, if you are predicate on only one type, Types and single argument concepts become very similar. A type specifies a set of operations implicitly or explicitly um, uh, used and uh, specifies how the object is laid down in memory. Whereas a single argument concept does the same, except that it doesn't say how things are laid down in memory, which means that you can actually write much more general code using single argument concepts than you can do with types. And so my ideal, which I think we are going to see a lot of over the next uh, decade or something, uh, you can use concepts where you now use types. And so you can write your code without worrying too much about how things are laid out. 
that's something you lay out when you create the first object, but when you operate on it, you are, you are in ignorance of that. Um, there was a big discussion uh, over the years in the design of concepts, which is we would like to test things in uh, isolation, test a, um, a, uh, what's it called, a, a, an algorithm, generic algorithm in, oh, yes. This was what we wanted to do. I wanted to say that there's an input iterator P and N, and I want to be able to catch the fact that you cannot do um, plus or plus equal on an input iterator. And uh, it would be nice to do that in isolation so you could separate, get separate compilation of, um, of uh, template functions, but um, we, we worked on that and it got harder and harder to achieve and it tended to uh, cause some overheads if we did it in any simple way. And then we realized that if we did this separate um, compilation of templates, we lost the ability to uh, modify uh, implementation without modifying its interface. So if you look at real code, people put debug output in, but they don't want the debug output to affect the interface of the function. If I want to debug this function, I do not want to give it an extra argument, which is my output, my debug output operator, or telemetry, or uh, statistics gathering of the use of the functions. And uh, basically we decided, no, we're not going to do this. We can get almost all of the benefits of uh, checking concepts without checking the implementation till late as ever. Uh, this gives advantages to users more than implementers, but there's many more users than there are implementers and we, uh, we, we decided to, to skip definition checking for now. Now, people will then say you skipped a, a definition checking because you didn't know how to do it. This is untrue. Gabby Dos Reyes uh, did an experiment that shows how the use of compile time predicates can be used to achieve separate compilation of templates. We just decided not to do it until we can find some way of uh, dealing with the instrumentation of implementations uh, the, the way we wanted them. So um, there's many other facilities here to support um, generic programming. One of them were lambdas. We've always used function objects. That's one of the very early things in, in, in C++. We can define an object that has an application operator and then you can have an object that carries state and can be called just like a function. Um, Jaco Yavi uh, designed a notation and an implementation uh, that is a better notation for how to create function objects. So we can now say sort V with the function here that given two elements uh, will uh, compare their absolute values. So that's the call operator. This basically generates a function objects and the function object has a really good inlining of its operations because all the information is available. Um, so this is a much better use of, um, of, of, the, of the, the old style of coding. I was a bit nervous about this for a while thinking people would write unnamed functions that had no real meaning but uh, I've been convinced that this is actually amazingly uh, useful uh, and uh, didn't create the horrors of, um, of, of, of really bad embedded code very often. Of course, every new feature will be overused and misused, including Lambdas, but on average, it's good. And um, we, uh, we basically, uh, can access local state. So this is the C++ version of local functions. It specifies in a binding clause here to the Lambda uh, that it would like to operate on the local uh, variable. And you can either do this by reference or by, um, by um, value. 
Um, by value is very important if you have concurrency here, um, whereas references are, are quite uh, useful when you have local things. Uh, Variadic template is another thing that came in in this time period. This was uh, Doug Gregor who invented uh, variadic templates. They had two uh, very important import, uh, uh, effects. You could do an arbitrary number of arguments with an arbitrary uh, set of types, and you could pass that to a function easily. As usual, we could do it before. Some people have done it before, and it was a pain in the neck. It was very difficult. Um, and so I'm not going to explain this. Some of you understand it very well. Uh, but basically, it, it's, it's a recursive function that works over a sequence of elements. These elements can be of any type. And so you, you can use it. Define this kind of thing can be a bit of a nuisance. If you love functional programming, it's a little bit more natural than if you're in the uh, more traditional C++ camp. But the use is very simple. So here we can have the value of the string is G and we pass the arguments. They are fully type checked. There's a standard library um, component called formats that is basically done this way. And <clears throat> the compile time computation uh, became more and more important. Uh, Gabby and I designed um, functions to be defined to, to be executable at compile time, uh, basically to support um, embedded systems where you couldn't afford to have real function calls and also to support things like uh, concepts. Concepts are simply uh, compile time functions that, uh, that, that, that computes like this. Um, so um, we can do a recursive um, factorial and that was all we could get people to accept in the beginning. It was hard enough to get them to uh, accept recursion, uh, but it worked and for C++11. Um, it was deemed unimplementable and useless at the time, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the most popular features these days, and it got generalized. If you don't like the recursive implementation of Factorial, you can do uh, the iterative one. And here we need to have local variables that exist only at compile time, but that's easy. They uh, live inside the compiler. And of course, C++ is designed to create abstractions, classes and things like that. So it works not just for built-in types, but also for <coughs> more advanced types. So here's a static assert. It uh, says that today is a Wednesday. Uh, this is uh, executable code and uh, the compiler will not let this static assert pass if it's not true. So if you try and execute this code tomorrow, uh, it will fail, but today it will work. And this is in the standard library now. Uh, basically, that's handiwork of, um, of uh, Howard Hinnant again, the guy that did uh, move semantics. Um, the thing that will probably be most notable uh, in C++ 20 to a lot of people is modules. Um, we've always known that C header file, the C header file module is, is pretty horrid, really. It doesn't offer modularity. And uh, I crouched about it in, uh, in, the, in the design evolution of C++, and there's been a steady attempt to try and provide a better way of providing modules, providing modularity, uh, packaging libraries, things like that. And the C++ 20 design came in uh, 2009 to 2019. I mean, solidly in the period we're talking about here. Uh, Gabby did the uh, implementation at uh, Microsoft based on some work he and I had done in Texas for representing code. Richard uh, Smith did the Clang implementation at Google, and Nathan Sit Sitwell from Facebook did the GCC implementation. They are all shipping uh, now um, and, and can be used. So basically, what's modularity? Basically, modularity, if I take two imports and I do them in the opposite order, I should get the same result. 
uh, in uh, standard C, C++ includes, that is not true. A can affect B and B can affect A and you get um, re different results if you're unlucky. Um, also include is transitive. So anything that is used in the implementation or needed in the implementation of A is now affecting B and it is, has to be compiled every time you do these includes. Imports are not transitive and you can compile them at once. Uh, on the other hand, we have billions of lines of code depending on, um, on imp imports, on includes. And a lot of that code is really messy and it's hard to clean up messy to, um, code. So because this is ugly and slow and messy, it's hard to replace. But we have huge code bases and uh, we have established tool chains and procedures so it's hard to get to use this, but when you do, you get benefits. You get code hygiene, you're protected against macros, you're protected against unexpected dependencies in your code. It's much better code. So here's a simple example of a module. I'm going to export a sequence printer. I, uh, I uh, use some stuff to implement my sequence printer Notice that I use that in the module implementation. It is not exported to, uh, to, to my users. And I want to export just a function that prints a printable input range, and it just goes through and well prints the elements. Uh, this is the simplest module I could think of uh, because I had to think of something that fits on the slide. <laughs> but the code gets pretty. Um, apart from the words export and import, and uh, this is just perfectly ordinary code. Uh, so uh, th this changes the way we think about code. It changes the way we compose code, but the individual functions and data types are not affected. They can do, we can write good code the way we're used to. And the benefit comes from the hygiene is efficiency uh, of compilations. So here's an example, which I borrowed from uh, somebody in Germany from a, a, a library. So you include the library, you use uh, it a little bit, and there's the compile times. Now you change the include to the import version of that library, which she had um, uh, written uh, using the old version here, and the compile time improves. Uh, by a time, 25 times. You can't expect all of your code to compile 25 times faster, but it is not uh, totally unusual. I have seen improvements from uh, no improvement to more than 50 times improvements in compile time speeds. Basically, you do all the hard work once for the uh, module, and then however many times you include it, it has been done. If you are including it just one time, you get the 25 times, even though you are only including it once. This is good stuff. I did some experiments myself. Um, the standard doesn't yet have modules for you to use directly. But what if it had? And what I would really like to do is to eliminate having to remember which standard header has which facility, which is a source of complexity. Um, there's uh, sort of 50 years of uh, history embedded in the uh, organization of the include files and it confuses people especially new users and it's a barrier to entry i wrote a paper from the latest um, c plus uh, plus mailing for the standards committee proposing uh, import std std gives me the whole standard library so i could just say give me the standard library and use it and traditionally, of course, you couldn't afford to do that with includes, but we can. Here are some numbers that uh, you can see in the paper, but basically the import STD version uh, that you see on the slide uh, took uh, almost a tenth of a second. Uh, whereas uh, if you uh, take a more heavy bunch of, uh, of uh, headers and, and use them with STD, you still get the speed ups. I mean, here you, you have the, what is that? That's a factor of 10. 
if you included all the headers, the, the factor goes up to uh, something much higher. So we, we don't do that, but we can afford to just import. Um, the other thing that happened in the period 2006 to 2020 was that we, um, we, we did the formalized concurrency. Um, we've always used concurrency, but it hasn't been standardized, not ISO standardized. And so, of course, we had to provide the traditional foundation, which everybody was using. Uh, the operating systems were using um, lock for, uh, that, um, uh, Windows and POSIX, threads, mutexes. And we started by building a memory model, um, then um, building from there lock-free programming, giving atomics, and then a little bit futuristic stuff. Later in uh, the release, we get more and more um, facilities building on that, but we had to start with the foundation, and the foundation was a memory model. There's actually a curious fact there. We thought, um, at least I thought, that uh, Java had a pretty good memory model, so why don't we adopt that? And that will save us a lot of work. And um, so I, I mentioned this, and the representatives from various important groups such as Microsoft and IBM says you can't do that uh, because if you adopt the, C, the Java memory model for C++, our Java um, implementations will slow down by at least a factor of two and you just can't do that to Java. Uh, so we had to do something that is far more complicated and tricky and harder to use and we get the usual critique of C++ for being too complicated, but at least we managed to keep Java running as fast as Java traditionally runs, which is not as good as C++, but still it's, um, it's what they were used to and what we still delivered. And uh, let's see, what else did we get? So one of the reasons we're sitting here is coroutines. Coroutines was my bread and butter for the first 10 years of C++. This was what C++ was really good at, which allowed people to write programs that they couldn't write in any other language at the time at reasonable performance. Uh, it was killed by lack of support in the Spark architecture uh, in about 1990. And so we lost it. And I, I really felt the loss, but uh, couldn't do anything about it for a long time. Um, Coroutines were, were not fashionable. People thought threads were fast enough, they're not. Uh, they thought processes were fast enough, they're not, not for a lot of the details we wanted. So finally, thanks mostly to the effort of Gordon Ishirov, um, we got C++ coroutines in, um, in, in, in 20. And they can be synchronous and asynchronous. And uh, here is a simple Fibonacci thing that says we have a state here. We start with an initial state, we compute the next in sequence, and we yield a result. The, the basic point about coroutines is that they preserve local state between calls. So if we keep calling uh, Fibonacci, we get a new number each time calculated with the usual formula of, um, of, of Fibonacci numbers. Again, this is a very simplified example because I wanted to fit on a slide and in a talk that uh, didn't take all that long. And it's really good for pipelines and generators. And also, um, when, if, if you have uh, something here that uh, can suspend, uh, you can use it for um, asynchronous programming. And it has been used for asynchronous programming with sort of 200,000 uh, coroutines, uh, creating a network of uh, facilities that is just immensely faster than if you've done threading, uh, normal threading. Um, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is actually parallel algorithms. Um, we started with them in the standard, they're in 20, and they were some of them were in 17. Basically, if I have an algorithm and I don't have to know how it's implemented, um, somebody else has done the work for me, that's the idea. <coughs> Compilers are not smart enough to figure out whether um, parallelization or vectorization is worthwhile. 
because it takes time at either compile time or runtime. So you can say, say that you want parallelization of uh, your operation, and you can say you want vectorization of your uh, algorithms. Um, all of, essentially, all of the standard algorithms are uh, now uh, exist in parallel implementations and uh, vectorized implementations. There's, we still don't have um, some of the really important algorithms for parallel execution, find any and find all, find finds the first. That's not a very ideal algorithm for, for um, <clears throat> parallel stuff. But anyway, we have a lot of them, including uh, the ones you can see there. So uh, we, we are moving steadily towards having a, a foundation for parallel algorithms. So uh, let's see. Where are we today? Uh, with um, C++ in 2020, we actually, it's the peak of C++. It's the best C++ we've ever seen, and it has the largest number of uh, users we've ever seen. It's used more widely than everything. I, I call it the invisible foundation of everything. Of course, everything is a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's in all countries, all industries. Uh, the code is shorter and, uh, and uh, faster than it used to be. Um, I call it invisible because it's very often down in the infrastructure. We are using C++ in many ways right now, and we don't see it. I should have invented a little C++ inside logo. Uh, that would have been good. We don't see it. We don't see it in the um, telecommunications we're using. We don't see it in the cameras we're using. We don't see it in the operating systems we're using. We, we don't see it in the signal processing we're using. Uh, we, we tend not to see C++. Uh, usually it is under a layer, very often written in another language, Java, C Sharp, Python, or something like that, uh, but it's there. Um, Somebody did a survey of work at, say, Microsoft, and there was exactly one thing that everything depended on, it was C++. Um, we, we have a huge standards committee where I think actually impatience and over-enthusiasm is the, the major worries now. There's the usual weakness in tools. We, we don't have the financing. Uh, everybody is a volunteer here, and we don't have a, a sugar daddy corporation that uh, spends a significant strategic amount of money on C++. And very often people mischaracterize it. Um, people see C++ as it was back in uh, 84 or thereabouts and then criticize it, or they dig out a criticism from um, 25 years ago and see that as gospel. I mean, this morning I saw a reference to Linus's uh, comments about C++. Uh, back in the early 90s, where even I wouldn't use the, C, the GCC uh, uh, C++ compiler. Um, and, and, well, that was a couple of decades ago, and the world looks rather different today than it was uh, 25 years ago. There's a weakness in education. People prefer things they see as either more advanced or as more uh, as simpler. And uh, we, we have now an increased focus on correctness and safety. The core guidelines are my uh, particular uh, bet for that. Um, I, I, I want to be able to do uh, guaranteed safe uh, code where safe is defined as, as tape, type and resource safety. So what could we have done better? Uh, I tried hard to communicate uh, the ideas of C++ effectively but I wasn't always um, successful, uh, partly because I talked to people in industry where they wanted all the implementation details and all the most advanced interfaces where advanced meant controlled, and that didn't uh, translate well to other communities. Um, there was a lack of emphasis in tools. WG21, the C++ Standards Committee, is defined by ISO to deal with language, not tools. We need to do more. Um, I, I would like standard packaging and build systems. The problem is not that we don't have these things. The problem is we've got at least five or probably a dozen. Uh, and we, we don't have a standard. 
um, at least we should have a standard interface to that kind of stuff. And uh, I would like us to see a standard non-textual program representation. I designed one together with Gabby Does Rays uh, back in 07 or thereabouts. And it's the basis of, uh, of the module implementation at Microsoft. So it has been, it's, 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 it's alive and it's work, but that would help tool building because one of the barriers to use of C++ and tools is that it's too hard to analyze uh, and use. And if people work based on token-based stuff, they, they, they get something that's complicated and slow. And uh, not enough emphasis on distribution of common libraries. The standard library should, of course, be improved, and it will be improved. And then there's language details, but well, they are details. These are things that I would have liked to see. And you could read the design and evolution of C++, and uh, you'll see uh, the last two. And you can see proposals for operator dot uh, coming over the years, but that's details. The important thing is to C++, see C++ as a ecosystem and see what's uh, wrong in the ecosystem. So we also got some things right. The articulation was there. Some people understood the principles. We have emphasized both stability and evolution. I think we need both. Uh, stability because uh, people have old programs, because people want to rely on old programs, and because they can rely on old programs, they trust that the programs they write today can be used in, say, 10 years' time. And evolution because the world changed and we change. Um, we uh, worked on the standards effort. It's a pain in the neck, of course, but it kept the, uh, the community together and um, stopped serious uh, dialect uh, generation. Uh, the work on the static type system gave good abstractions, good uh, resource management and good performance. And uh, it gave us direct access to the hardware and system uh, resources. This is a non-trivial statement because there's always every year people suggesting that why don't we give up on all of this messy low level stuff and see compatibility and just build a real language. And that would break the stability, it would break compatibility and it would break performance. Uh, we, we, we need to, to live with uh, our mistakes as well as our successes and we need to deal with hardware. Lots of people do. There's more embedded systems than there are non-embedded systems in the world. So C++ is better, significantly better than the previous versions. The type system is better and the code's better. And so to summarize things here, uh, C++ has a static type system with close to equal support for built-in types and user-defined types. And it has both value and reference semantics. Um, value semantics so that you can copy things and. Uh, move things, references, so that you can have like pointers. And the systematic and general resource management, uh, known by the silly acronym RAII, which I'm resp responsible for so I can criticize it, a uh, scope-based um, thing based on constructors and destructors, which basically was what came in the first uh, week of C++. There's uh, good support for object-oriented programming, uh, good support for generic programming. And uh, we are, we're getting improved uh, support, actually pretty good support for compile time programming. There's always been a need to compute things at compile time, but using macros is just horrid. Um, and uh, just like uh, macros were horrid for generic programming. So we have overcome that and we still have direct use of machine operating system support. Uh, and uh, this goes down to the level of being able to use specialized hardware, um, FPGAs, GPUs, things like that. And basically, this is a talk. I've talked for uh, just over an hour, hour and a quarter, and I presented 15 years of C++ uh, plus more. And if you want the less hand wavy version of it, uh, read the papers. It's well documented in peer reviewed papers uh, over the years. 
And uh, with that, I will switch to uh, Q&A mode. Hope you've got some, uh, some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Um, if people have questions, please come down and stand next to me and we try to reduce the uh, echoes. A, A, A. Just a small question. What about uh, link time? Um, first of all, there is a vicious echo. So I may have to ask you to repeat questions later. But what about link times? Well, link times is, is, is a pain. And uh, I, I think modules will help a little bit, but uh, I don't have any measurements to back this up, so I, I don't know. Um, personally, I, for, for a lot of the systems I want uh, to deal with, I like static linkage, um, which create good performance. And uh, dynamic linking is supposedly uh, faster, but in my experience, uh, quite often, uh, uh, slows down the program and uh, makes it unpredictable. Um, okay. My question is following. Um, currently, Microsoft has a language known as C++.net, which is a widely differing implementation of C++. I guess what I was wondering about is what prevents from a C++ implementation like this to form its own dialect, like what Android did with Java? I think that C++.net is a dialect, and it's not a dialect I'm a particular fan of. And I think it has, to a large extent, failed because the community uh, didn't like it and because it was only on Microsoft platform. And so um, it's, I think it deserved to fail. Uh, Microsoft had their reasons for doing it. Uh, they were Microsoft reasons and uh, I they, 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 they can make their decisions. I, I prefer no dialects. I, I was wondering if you can say a few words about uh, quote unquote uh, C++ replacement languages, in particular uh, D and Rust. Um, uh, from from the earliest days, there's always been people who uh, wanted to build a simpler and better competitor to C++, the most obvious one being Java, uh, where they came out uh, fighting, declaring uh, C++ um, pollution and garbage. Um, anyway, uh, the, the more modern versions are, of course, nicer. They have decades more of experience. And um, I'm not a particular fan of them, but then why wouldn't would I be? I'm glad to see more languages. I'm glad to see more uh, attempts to build new languages. Uh, we don't want to, to think that what we have today is the best that can be possibly done. Um, I like the idea that Rust is basically uh, using the same kind of model as uh, C++ or RAII and such. I am somewhat amused when Rust uh, followers accuse me of having borrowed ideas like that from Rust. Uh, it's the other way around. Uh, I was there 20 or 30 years earlier. Um, apart from that, I don't know if they're better. When I tried to play with the Rust, I found it 
quite um, complex to, to get work done. Um, and uh, well, it takes a long time to, to, to build up the infrastructure. And if it's uh, complete safety you want, uh, get uh, the, the core guidelines uh, checker, which will provide memory and resource safety. But uh, by all means, uh, keep, keep inventing new languages and new ways of writing code. Um, we, we could certainly do with, with things that are better. And if something comes that definitely looks like better, I'll try and uh, see if I can uh, get it to work in, in the context of C++. Just like the designers of other languages look at other, at, at other languages and try and absorb it into theirs. Hey, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, on a somewhat similar note, I wanted to ask about uh, interoperability between languages. The current lingua franca is uh, C or external C. Sorry, sorry, I missed this completely to echo. I... Please try again. Okay, so thanks a lot, first of all. And I'm asking about interoperability between languages and the current de facto standard, which is extern C whether you would uh, endorse an effort to maybe standardize like an ABI for C++ uh, to be the lingua franca between languages. Thank you. It, it would be really nice to have a standardized ABI for C++, but the attempt to do so has, has failed. Uh, each platform vendor uh, likes to um, have, the, have control of their platform and they tend to um, be, be quite um, protective of their existing ABIs. And the reason is, of course, that in the future, everybody will benefit from a, a new and standard ABI, but an older ABI is what everybody is using today. And you need, a, a trans you need to go from the one to the next, and that's not trivial. Furthermore, a standardized API, ABI would uh, freeze the interface the way, say, the JVM has frozen uh, how you implement Java, uh, because either you take repeated API breaks or uh, you you, you don't. And so uh, one, it is not something that the language committee can uh, address under its charter. And if we did it anyway, which is very tempting, um, then we don't actually control the platforms. And there's many more platforms than we usually think about, um, mostly in the embedded uh, world. So very hard problem. I don't know how to solve it. Um, you said we have to live with our problems and with our mistakes. Do you see any long-term solution that will allow us to fix some of these mistakes? Um, you have to look at it um, case by case. People are very prone to saying, uh, let's solve all the problems or saying we can solve none of the problems. Uh, experience shows that you can solve some problems, but not all. And what I meant uh, was, was roughly that, uh, that, that we can't just solve all the old problems. We must, of course, try and solve every problem that there is, but Quite often, we cannot solve it by removing the opportunity to make the mistake or to do the old stuff. Uh, my favorite is to move to a, a different use of the language and leave the old one alone. So if, uh, say, your, um, say, 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 say your hash table um, or your um, regular expression engine are too slow because the interface in uh, C++ uh, uh, 11 uh, wasn't ideal, uh, the first thing I would do would be to provide my own implementation 
that was uh, was more optimal and give it a, a new name uh, and then uh, get on with the work. The purpose is to deliver a, a good system. If I had done something there where the new thing was significantly better and it wasn't just a specialization for my environment, then I could propose it to the standard as a, a, a new um, component for the standard. But breaking the old code in, in significant ways is not always an option. Sometimes it is, but boy, it can be difficult. Uh, we went from um, copy on write implementations of string to the current uh, short string optimization. And it caused so much pain over the years. It took a decade for GCC to catch up. And uh, people have reported back that it has cost them uh, years of work. Uh, it, it's not that easy to break things. It's easier to provide an alternative. But look at the things one by one. Different, lots of different problems have different constraints on, uh, on how you can solve it. You have to take advantage of that. Hello, can you please comment? Please comment about the progress of the committee during the COVID area. Do you think the, we, uh, we will see any major features in C++ 93, uh, 23, sorry. Um, I mean, COVID has made it very difficult to make progress in anything. Um, I find it is really, um, I guess I shouldn't say painful, but uh, it is difficult to make progress on sort of open-ended things, on design issues. These are the kind of problems that are best done in informal uh, situations and in situations where people are face-to-face -face and when they have a whiteboard. So uh, the, the feedback process is, is slowed down. I mean, Zoom is, is great. We would not have managed as well without it, but it is better if you have an agenda, if you have a planned uh, talk and things like that. Discussion of problems and uh, potential solutions are, are not uh, done as well uh, in this situation. And having a large committee, large meaning 350 people would like to take part um, electronically. This is not the way you make progress uh, on uh, standard. We have many meetings. Um, we have meetings, I think, uh, almost as many meetings as the, in a month as there's days in the month. So nobody can be everywhere. But it's hard to make major uh, improvements. And so C++23, in my mind, was not meant to have major things. It was meant to be basically completing C++20. When you deliver a major new release of anything, a major new project, there are things you can't do in the last uh, year of development. You can't introduce radical new features. You cannot implement things you need to uh, changes that you know you need, but you don't have time because of the feature freeze and such. And there's things you can't learn until you've got the full system. So the way I saw it was C++14 completed C++11, which was a major uh, release. C++20 was a major release and therefore 23 should complete 20. And so I, for some definition of major, I didn't expect it to be major in the first place. Um, secondly, it is not going to have as many features as we would have had if we could work full speed. And we can't, we can't meet. We've canceled several meetings. We don't know when the next uh, real meeting will happen. Um, I would like to see uh, better support for better library support for coroutines. I would like to see modules in the standard for the standard library components. 
and I would like to see finally um, the formalization of the basic concurrency, uh, what's known as executors. Whether we are going to get those three, which was the top of our list before COVID, and it's the top of our list now, is, uh, uh, is unknown. We're trying, but it's really, really hard. Okay, last question now. Um, how do you feel about um, compile time code generation um, so they could have C++ code that gets evaluated at compile time that generates its own C++ code that then would actually get compiled into the final executable? Um, I'm not very enthusiastic about that in general. Uh, but I, I do like the idea of static reflection, which is related. Um, that is, you can, uh, it may be what you were talking about, but uh, uh, static reflection would allow you to do th things like saying, uh, give me a JSON for these three types. And uh, it would generate the code. You have precisely specified what you are doing. Uh, doing arbitrary code generation, um, try asking your security guys about what they think about that. Uh, they, they start tearing out their hair. What if I can call an operating system facility from the, uh, during compile time? Um, so fully general uh, compile time code generation is, is downright dangerous. Uh, but uh, formalized uh, limited, flexible way um, is, is, is very promising. There's a group working on static reflection and uh, I've written papers on it. It's, uh, we'll, we're going to get it, but we're not going to get it in 23. Uh, we were hoping for it in 23, but that's one of the things that we definitely won't get. Okay, bye, okay, bye, bye, bye. Thank you so much for joining us at CORE C++ 2021. It was a wonderful talk. We really appreciate it. And we definitely hope to see you here again in, in Israel in 2022. Thank you. I, I hope to be there in person and uh, we can do it much better then. But until then, uh, have, a, have a good time and uh, read the papers if you're interested in more stuff. and. Uh, you can also find me with email if uh, if you had to. Okay, bye.